George Porter Jr., thanks so much for joining us here on A Breath of Fresh Air. What a pleasure to have your company. Uh, thank you very much for the invite. You want to walk us through your early life and we'll lead up to what's going on for you today? Well, yeah. Art Neville kind of recruited me into a, a new band that he was starting. At the time, it didn't have a name. It was just Art Neville in the band. <laughs> and then we were playing a club called The Nightcap in the Uptown New Orleans. And and this disc jockey, he would come and visit us on, on Saturday nights. We used to play like Thursday, Friday, or Saturday at this club. So this one particular Saturday night, the, um, this disc jockey came on stage and he wanted to introduce the band for the third set. And uh, he came up on stage and he made a big speech and everything. And he said, welcome to the stage, Art Neville and the Neville Sound Band, which at the time it was only Art Neville in the band. It was, you know, it was a... It was a five-piece band with Art Neville, Leo Nocentelli, Joseph Modulus, and a saxophone player named Gary Brown uh -huh. and myself. We played that nightcap for a couple of years. I'm kind of like foggy in my mind of what year we actually left the nightcap and went to the French quarters and where we played and the band shrunk down to just four pieces. But I think it had to be somewhere like late 65 or 66. And that's when the name um, change um, came along? Yeah, and then the, at that point, we were, the, the band was being called Art Neville and the Boys at that time because of the, the gentleman, the keyboard piano player used to play opposite of us at, on Bourbon Street. He would play a solo piano and he would, he would sing the song Bill Bailey. And he'd say, won't you come home, Art Neville? Won't you come home? And bring your boys with you. <laughs> Alan would come down, and, you know, from every now and then, and he would, you know, kind of park his El Dorado on the street and listen to us play. The doorman would always tell us when he said, "He said, yeah, man, your boy, your boy, um, your boy Alan Tuset was outside listening to y'all." And then one Saturday night, Art told us that um, Alan wanted us to come down to his studio that Monday, you know, to to do some demos or or, or to to audition, that's what it was. And we went down that Monday, did an audition um, for Alan. And basically we were playing some Lee Dorsey's song, the songs that was eventually keynoted for Lee Dorsey. We did very well, you know, as a tracking band for Alan. So, he, you know, we got the job. <laughs> and you became his house band then, yeah? We, be we became, his became his house band for um, several years. George, how big was Alan Toussaint at that time? Well, he had a pretty, I, I would think he was not as large as he got as he went on, but he, he was pretty well known. He was probably one of the most um, prolific recording songwriters in the city at the time. Right. You know, record labels from all over, the, all over the world was sending their artists to him to record. So, you know, we recorded behind a lot of, a lot of people. Some of them that we did hear were people like Dr. John and Paul McCartney, Lee Dorsey, as you mentioned, Earl King, Robert Palmer. And of course, you did play backing with Patti LaBelle on that number one hit, Lady Marmalade, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. It was a, a wonderful session. We went through three drummers to do that, to get that session recorded. <laughs> How come? Well, um, it was a uh, difference between, um, you know, between the drummer and, uh, and the drummers and Alan. The session started as with the original meters, the original four meters, Zig, Leo, Art, and myself. And then I think just the air of three Capricorns being in the same room, trying to function <laughs> over 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 a few years as as we have been doing, I guess that that uh, it, that Zig and Alan just wasn't gelling anymore. So Zig kind of backed away from the session. And um, James Black was brought in, another wonderful um, drummer from New Orleans. He was brought in, but um, he, he and Alan didn't gel at all from the start. So uh, James was just in there for that one day, uh, maybe two tracks. And, you know, Alan, you know, took a break, a lunch break, and, cut, and then the engineer would call in and say, oh, we're done for the day, gentlemen. <laughs> same, same time tomorrow. The new <laughs> you know, drummer. Uh, the next day we came in and Herman Ernest was the drummer and he's the <laughs> one who ended up finishing the record. Yeah. Ah. And what about Patti LaBelle? How was she to work with? Well, Patti, we really didn't have much contact, you know, with her and the artist, but um, the last day of the session, 
I think as I remember, mom, uh, I remember mom, I brought them to my mom's house. My mom fixed a dinner for us at gumbo and stuff like that. And you know, they were good people, you know, all three of them, her and Sarah and um and what was the other guy's name? God, I think, uh, can't think of her name. And I and I was in New York a couple of months ago and and called her. Don't worry. We've all got that going on as we get older. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm roughly 75 now. <laughs> oh, well, you, you're doing pretty well and making fabulous music. We're going to talk about the new album shortly. But just going back to the meters at the outset, I mean, you became pretty well known during that time as, as house band for Alan. In fact, you did the song Sissy Strut came off your self-titled 1969 debut. That became your greatest commercial hit, didn't it? That I think that was the um, one that climbed the charts better. Yeah, that was the the the, the, uh, the biggest one. I think we had about two or three others that kind of opened the doors. I think it was um, Look a Pie Pie. I believe it was the other one was. Dun, 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 dun. I can I forget the names. Yeah, it'll come. It'll it'll come back to you. It's a long time ago now, for but sure. We we had we had five songs that actually went into the, the charts, the Billboard charts, not just the R and B charts, but the popular choice, yeah. which was for New Orleans artists. We were the first um, New Orleans artists to do that. That was pretty cool. You guys were really cutting the way for funk at the time, weren't you? You, you were known as one of the progenitors of funk, along with Sly and the Family Stone and Parliament Funkadelic. There wasn't too much of that going on. Yeah, uh, well, you know, for in, in my world, I never, you know, I never thought of the, of the, the music as being funk. But you know, I, I always used to tell a joke about it uh, on that how what funk music came from. You know, is that when it's one this one early morning, this kid wake, uh, wakes up on the sofa with a joint in his hand and he hears some music, and and he leans over and say, "Oh man, that's funky." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. From there, there hence the, um, the idea of funk music. You know? The title, right. What what had you considered it before it was labelled funk? Well, it was always labelled R&B. You know, we were, we were labelled an R&B, an R&B band. So, you know, and then they, they, so there was blues and then there was rhythm and blues. And we were always considered the R&B band, um, you know, until, you know, until um, we moved. And in fact, I think we got kind of started calling us a funk band when we are uh, around 75, mostly 75, but really in 76, when we did those two Rolling Stones tours, then the writers, the writers start saying the Rolling Stones had a funk band on tour with them, you know. So it was kind of more of an adjective than a noun. Yes, yes. And what were those tours like with the Stones? That must have been an amazing uh, experience. Yeah, it was. It was very, very unique. <laughs> Very unique. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, open up a bit. I mean, they were they were bad boys. Everybody was partying right, very yeah, hard in we were, those days. We were, I was very hard. I played hard, hard, hard myself. I mean, I would probably say '76 was the beginning of my really hard, hardcore cocaine use. I mean, I had been using cocaine prior to that and smoking pot since I was 16, but in '76 I really started doing. Large numbers of large amounts of, of cocaine, and uh, or in fact, it almost almost ended me in '76. At the end of that tour, I got home. And I played a gig on. I think it was like a Saturday night, and I went home and went to bed. And the next time I woke up was four days later, and I was in the hospital. Uh-huh. And um, apparently, um, my wife's my wife said that she called an ambulance for me because. When she when she woke up, she looked over the side of the bed, and I had, I had I was like I was pale, seriously pale, looked like there was no blood in my body, and she called the house, hospital, and I, pretty much the doctor told my mom that I had double pneumonia, and it was funny but not funny, but he told he told my mom that's how my mom found out that I was using cocaine. He told my mom that if it wasn't for the cocaine, I probably would have been dead. So the, 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 I had double pneumonia, but the cocaine apparently Saved was doing something. The cocaine was doing something to, to my body to keep me from killing myself. I, I don't, you know, I don't know how. To, don't do it. Did that experience curtail your usage? For a few months, yeah, for a few months. But it, it wasn't until um '88 that I got completely sober. I've been sober um 34 years now. 
Uh, you, you're lucky that you did, aren't you? Because it could have really taken a terrible toll. Yeah, well, you know, it was it was the, uh, the thought of actually losing my family that, that got me into a treatment center. Right. And, right. Um, and, 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 and has kept me sober, yeah. Congratulations. There was a lot to be said for that. At one stage of your life, you considered joining the priesthood. <laughs> when I was uh, 14 and 15, actually 13 and 14, uh, somewhere between my, my 14th birthday, we, uh, I went to a, 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 a Catholic monastery up in, in Mississippi, not far from my house. And, you know, it was um, considering um, the, 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 um, the priesthood. But the problem that, that turned me against it was that it was a retreat. I guess it was called a retreat. But I, we, had to, we had to be silent. We couldn't speak. Oh, you know, right. for, the, for, for the three weeks we were there, you know, we had, there was no <laughs> conversation, you know. <laughs> I, I remember, like, um, I think it was like two and a half weeks into it, I called my mom, told her, said, come get me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you did well for two and a half weeks. That's amazing. <laughs> imagine imagine how different your life would have turned out if you'd gone that route. Oh, yeah, right. Well, the flying nun. <laughs> <laughs> I love that show. <laughs> Alan popped his head into our sessions once or twice. When we in the studio... You know, we don't know what's going on in the control room. And we found out years later that Alan had a line going up to his studio, uh, up to his office above the studio, that he you know he can monitor whatever's going on in the, in, the, in the control room. One of the things he never did, well, this is how, a uh, quick story of this, this is how the Robert Palmer Project songs got put together. We were downstairs working, working out the song, and we recorded all three songs. And then Alan came down and made a couple of suggestions. And then, you know, we re-recorded those, those three songs, leaving certain air happening at the end of each one of those songs. And then he pieced those three songs together and made, made it run, you know, the way, the way it did. But he did that because he was able to hear the session going while it was going down. It was cool. Was there a big fallout with him at the time? No, and, and that was absolutely um, not true. Alan never claimed the rights to the band. The name of the band actually was unprotected until I think it was probably little, mid and middle 80s or so. Because that, um, you, you changed it in the 80s to the Funky Meters, then why did you go through yet another name change? We, we changed the name for the, to the Funky Meters because it was just Art and myself performing. And uh, Leo was initially going to be a member of that funk, of the Funky Meters, but he decided that he didn't want to um, sign a contract. He didn't want to do, you know, W do, you know, because we was going to go through the whole tax thing. We was going to create a tax credits, you know, and stuff like that. And Leo wanted to be paid in cash, and he, you know, he just didn't want to be a. He didn't really want to be a part of a business. Then uh, um, turned into a manager slash partner with Art and myself, Steve Egerton, got us together and, 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 and uh, the three of us incorporated the Funky Meters. And while the time we was creating that copyright and brand, we discovered that the original Meters was un, not, not even original, it was just the Meters was never ever protected. So the Funky Meters took and put the meters uh, under our umbrella, but forever, you know, the, the, and I think it was in some sense, sense that a lot of people might have thought that Alan Toussaint and Marshall Sehon owned the name, the meters, but they never really did. It was never Alan Toussaint's thing. It was, it was his partner, Marshall Sehon, was pretty much the diva in any bad business or bad blood that happened between the band and C St. Studios. Oh, you must have been incredibly close to Art Neville for a long, long time. What was he like? Uh, he was a wonderful soul. <laughs> we fought all the time because we were always together. But no, he was sort of like that father figure that I, that I never really had. Me and my father never was, was close. And then the, the, the last three weeks of my, um, while I was in the treatment center, my father came and visited me or every Sunday. And we um, we planned to, you know, when I got out of treatment that, you know, we would spend more time together and get to know each other. And um, I got out on, um, the, on Halloween night 
from the Staples Center, came home. And um, that next morning, I went played a gig with um, some friends. And uh, my wife called me and told me that um, my father had passed away. Uh, so we never really got, you know, got to um, to, to, to be, become friends. You know? right. So Art Neville was pretty much the, the friend, you know, the friend of that. And Earl King also, we, you know, both of them, between those two guys, that was that was my father figures. They were really encouraged behind that uh, about about this record. And they hooked us up with the Saturday Night Live production thing and um, and everything and ended up, neither one of the two Neville brothers showed up for the gig. The, the three of us showed up with another another keyboard player. And, uh, you know, and that didn't go well. We, the performance went well, but the record label said, uh, and they just dropped us and the record. They didn't really make any noise off that, um, that New Direction album, which would, which would have been, which should have been a big record for the for the meters, a big commercial record. You know? Yeah, it was a great album. Why did the Neville Brothers not show? Well, I mean, Art left the band because there was a, a tour manager we had with us named Rupert Circle had convinced Art that the rest of the meters didn't sign the contract that he had given Art for us to sign. Well, if we didn't sign that contract, that Art should leave the leave the band and go off and play. With you know, because we also had recorded that record, the uh, um, Wild Chapatula's album with their uncle, Uncle Jolly, Big Chief Jolly. Yeah, and 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 that record was doing you know, pretty it was moving along really nice, and it, it, it didn't get to the you know, the big numbers, but it, it did, it, it made some noise. So Rupert told all uh, to us, said, Man, if they don't want to play, if they don't want to sign the contract, man, you should quit the band and play with your brothers. You know, that was something Art wanted to do anyway. Art had been trying to get the brothers to be in the, in the Meters band, but then the Meters would have ceased to exist because it had become the Neville Brothers, a vocal band, not an instrumental band. And then, you know, we had already given up pretty much a, a lot of space as far as being an instrumental band because we were, we were now pretty much a vocal band too, you know. So the Neville, with the Neville Brothers being in the band, the three other three musicians would have been lost, you know, yeah. even lost in the mix, you know. So would have changed that it was up entirely. That, yeah. yeah, that was something that we didn't want to do. And Art, so I was Art, Art quit the band on the airplane going home after we re uh, recorded the, the New Directions album. On that way home, Art quit the band. Oh, Cyril, what a shame. Cyril was still considering staying in the band, but then Art convinced him that he shouldn't do the Saturday Night Live because it was going to make, it was just what's going to show you know, a lack of loyalty to, to, to the brothers, you know, and so Cyril decided not to make the Saturday Night Live performance. So we went on the show with a keyboard player that's from another local family, um, Baptiste Brothers family, um, David Baptiste Sr., All right. which 20 years later, his son, Russell, David Russell Baptiste Jr., was a drummer in the Funky Meters. A small world, huh? <laughs> small world. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. After the Neville's departure and with David Batiste Sr. now on keyboards, the guys brought in Willie West as the band's lead singer. It wasn't long before George Porter Jr. also left the group and by 1980 the meters had officially broken up. None of them ever understood the influence they had exerted on the music scene. I don't believe the meters, even all the way up to the point where they had broke up, and really realized how inspirational they were as a band. You know, I think that if they really had paid much attention to what they were doing, and 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 uh, at the time when they were doing it, you know, it would have been better. I think we would have we'd have, we'd have probably lasted longer than we did as a band. Um, but unfortunately, well, fortunately, you know, I say not unfortunately, but fortunately for us, that the music itself outlasted the band you know and and at this point the music has um has allowed us individually you know to continue as um solo artists after the breakup art continued his career with the neville brothers ziggy started touring with keith richards and ron wood both leo and george became in-demand session players and formed new bands don't go anywhere the story is not quite finished yet Welcome back. The Meters defined New Orleans funk. Nearly all of their own recordings were instrumentals, putting the emphasis on the complex rhythms. 
the gritty grooves created such distinctive sound that they earned a devoted cult following during the 70s from people like Paul McCartney and Robert Palmer, both of whom used the group as a backing band for recording. After the Funky Meters broke up, you went on to become a, a highly coveted session bassist. There's something incredibly unique about the way you play and not being a musician I can't put that into words I'm hoping that you might be able to but you've influenced people like the Red Hot Chili Peppers like the Beastie Boys, Led Zeppelin, Bob Marley, Queen Latifah, Run DMC I could roll out a whole lot of names what is it about the way you play that's captured the imagination of all these musicians that were coming up behind you? You know I I can't take the credit for you alone you know, I believe there was something that the meters did and we did really well. We had, there was space between, you know, the bass and drums, you know, was always very closely tangled together. So, you know, there was always a nice space in, in, in the music for, you know, for other things to happen. And I mean, that was something I learned in person. I think I say I learned from the session working with Alan Toussaint is because he used to always say, it's not what you play, it's what you don't play that make this groove happen. And I think I think that was what a lot of musicians caught on to. I have a kind of a self-imposed rule that I go there with my mind wide open. And the first thing first is that, you know, I try and, and lock with the drummer. And so when I feel as a bass player, as close as I can get to the drummer, his pocket is going to pretty much dictate where the groove is and the pocket that I should climb into. So that was their secret ingredient, and it set the course for many bands to follow, paving the way for today's hip-hop sound. The idea of space being, um, you know, Colonel Bruce Hampton said, this, space is the place. <laughs> <laughs> I like but it. But <laughs> I think he was talking about up there. <laughs> Well, they certainly followed in your footsteps big time, didn't they? And you then went on and did a whole bunch of sessions with people like David Byrne and Jimmy Buffett, Tori Amos, Taj Mahal, until you started your own band called The Run and Partners in 1990. What brought that about? The need to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've always wanted, you know, in the meters, out of all those, you know, nine records, I think I was, I was only allowed to be able to record two of the songs that I wrote for the band. Which two? I had been, I, I, uh, um, one was uh, um, the same old thing. The other one, uh, I want, I keep saying, and Leo may disagree with me because, you know, he claimed he, wrote, he had wrote everything. But, um, God, I can't think of the name of it. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta, I, gotta, I just. It'll, it'll come back, don't worry. Let's, let's all, 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 all of our, you know, what with, with a lot of with all of the majority of the meters earlier years, and this 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 is when I was attempting to write music for the band, was when we were doing the instruments in those first three records. You know, everything from Cabbage Alley on, I had, you know, I had no in, in input as far as writing music for. I was writing songs, but even though know, I presented them and they got ignored or pushed to the side and said, Sorry No, we, we we ought to do this. Right. So I wanted to start, you know, doing, I wanted to start playing some music that I wrote. And there was a kind of a, a survival thing to, to take a shot at, um, you know, my own, on my own thing. So, you know, my little brother sent me a, a song that he, um, that he, the music to a song that eventually became the title track for my, my, my first album called Running Partners. The song "Running Partners" was, the, you know, I wrote the lyrics for it. My brother wrote the music, you know, and then I, you know, of course, I arranged, you know, I took my brother's as a template and just added some little pieces in it and made it, uh, made it the title song for the for the for, for the very first record. You had several others after that, and there were a few releases, including "Funk This" in two thousand and "Can't Beat the Funk" in twenty eleven. What was your favorite song from that from this period of time with the Running Partners? I think I kind of like reworked the song called I Get High and Happy Song. Happy Song has kind of survived from before Running Partners because it was, a, I had a, I was, in 1980, I had, a, I put, a, put together a band called Joyride. And uh, what I didn't put together the band, it was like a combination of a, a guitar player named Bruce McDonald and myself. We were writing songs together. And he said, man, this stuff is good, man. We should start a band. 
So, so that's that, that's what happened in 1980. Late, actually, late 79, we decided to just um let's just try and put a band together, you know, and 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 we went with it, and it lasted exactly one year. That you know, basically, it was too much drugs and alcohol, <laughs> and and the problem was is that we were all doing different drugs. <laughs> you know? so, so you know that the band didn't couldn't couldn't survive off of you know five guys playing different mindsets. You know? <laughs> These days, you've got the the band running partners still, don't you? Yes, Ruddy Parties is still a functioning band. Now it's a four-piece band. The keyboard player in this band has been in this band for 27 years, Michael oh. Limler. And you've got a new album out called Crying for Hope? Crying for Hope. That's that's the new um, the new record that was recorded in four different studios. We all, you know, we, we recorded the music in the cloud using Pro Tools. And, uh, you know, and it was during the COVID thing, so we couldn't see each other. So, but... um we discovered that we could still work together yeah. being in different places. And yeah. we did the, we did, we did the record in four different studios. Just Are you happy with it? I'm very pleased with the, uh, how it came out. Well, unlike any of my uh, previous recordings, they, none of them made the charts, but, um, you know, but it, you know, I got, I, I got, um, who you say I'm, I'm selling some records. It paid for itself. That's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, and and I guess the aim these days wouldn't be to top the charts. It'd be the satisfaction of of putting out music that does obviously pay for itself, and where you can just continue to express yourself creatively. Exactly. I, you know, my late wife told me. Um, she said that. Uh, she said, well, "What you gonna do? You know, if you know, it just just doesn't work for you, you know, you know." And I said, "Well, you know." Six years ago, we, me and her had this conversation. She passed away November 28th, three, three or four years ago. You know, she, she said, what are you going to do if, you know, if this just don't pan out for you? Because she said, you know, we, you, you should just quit playing, you know, and just, you know, maybe start teaching, you know, because I, I was getting a lot of requests to teach. You know? And I just never, never took it on because I just never thought I was that good. You know, I, I thought I knew I could play. I you know I could play, but I didn't think I was I was the kind of player that could teach. So you know that that was I, that was something that I didn't, never never yeah ever gave uh, a second thought. Are you the kind of player that could give up playing? Give up playing? Not yet, <laughs> not yet. I'm I'm still enjoying it. You know, we just did a, a tour with Trombone Shorty. And they were all on tour buses and stuff, you know. And I, I was invited to, to you know, to join onto the tour bus and travel with the guys, you know. And I, I declined and took my Ford Transit, custom Transit, on tour. And I, you know, we followed the tour buses all. Most of the time, we were in front of the tour buses yeah. and drove from the East Coast. We were from New Orleans all the way up the East Coast and, and all the way across to California. You know, everybody want you know everybody. Um, most of the guys, because I, I was like the, I was an artist with the Dumpster Funk band performing the music of the Meters. They all flew home, and you know, and they was trying. You know, the guys, you know, Tony Hall, the bass, or the guitarist, bass player in that band, was saying, "Man, Tony, you ought to, you ought to fly home, man. You, why you want to stay in that band for tw- thirty-seven hours? You know." And I said, "Bro, it's, it's, it's what I do." <laughs> And I, I got it. I got in my. I got in my van with my my keyboard player Michael Lim, um drove. You know, did did the majority of the driving, and and my girlfriend she came out and, and joined us in California, uh, and did the five the last five days. And you still, still love it, it, George? Yeah, I'm still. I'm still. You know, it's still it's still fun. I, you know, having. I mean, like I said, December 26, I'll be 75 years old, and. I'm still enjoying the road, you know, I still enjoy it. And playing in front of, you know, and I played in front of audiences that I hadn't, you know, that I hadn't done before. You know, we were playing in front of large numbers yeah. of people, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, they wasn't playing my music, but they was playing music I was a part of. George Porter Jr., which track on Crying for Hope is the closest to your heart? Crying for Hope is probably the A song, you know, but I, I kind of like the instrumental things. There's this one song on it called Spanish Moon. I wrote that song for the guitar player to play the lead on. The song was wrote by just me and my acoustic bass. I gave the, you know, the melody lick to, to Michael and then Michael arranged it with the um, and Pro Tools. 
And then, you know, sent it to Chris and I said, I asked Chris, I said, man, can you play this melody, you know, as written? You know, and, and they said, yeah. So, so basically what it ended up being is he doubled my part, but then I thought he was going to take my part away. And they both insisted, no, that needs to stay. I haven't played the song yet because I have to learn that bass line. <laughs> <laughs> George Porter Jr., great to meet you. It's so good that you're still playing, still touring, still loving it, and still putting out albums. Really appreciate your time today. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting. Yeah, tell those promoters over there, yeah, I'm ready. I got a bag, I stay packed. I'm ready to come back over. I haven't been there in a few years. <laughs> I will absolutely <laughs> let them know. Take care Sounds of yourself great. meantime, won't you, George? Bye-bye. Bye. The Funky Meters continued to play into the 2000s with the addition of Art Neville's son Ian from 2007 to 11. The group continued to play a few festivals together until Art Neville announced his retirement from music in 2018. He'd battled a number of health issues, including complications from back surgery. Art Neville died in July 2019 at the age of 81. And so ends the story of the band he founded, The Meters. Thanks for your company today. I really hope you've enjoyed hearing the story of that incredible band. I've certainly learnt a thing or two along the way too. Have fun, won't you, for the week coming up. I'll look forward to being back in your company again same time next week. Bye now.